Yeah, yeah. What's good, everybody? It's your boy, BQ, Impact Lounge. You already know, but it is the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. We're going to talk Impact Wrestling, no surrender. I apologize for all the times that I'm doing these podcasts and I'm rocking like an AEW shirt. That's I really wear wrestling shirts and sports shirts all the time. Um, I do have a lot of Impact shirts. It's just that uh, I do most of my shopping on pro wrestling tees because i prefer their style of t-shirt and i'm not a really big fan of the ones i get off the impact website so i can't get as much impact merch off there as i would like um if it comes to pro wrestling tees because you know some of the shirts double up you know if it comes to pwts cool but off the impact website i can't really fuck with it you know um so yeah sorry if that offends anybody uh, but but i do have impact shirts i swear to you so um anyway we're going to talk no surrender here. And these um, these monthly specials and, and even the pay-per-views at times, they're a little difficult to review from a solo standpoint because they're they're just wrestling shows. You know, when I do the Impact episodes, it's very different because there's backstage segments, even though most of them are bad, but there's a lot of backstage segments and stories being told and, and matches being built. And it's a little easier for me to talk about the show uh, when it's just like straight wrestling. It's a little difficult because I'm not a move for move guy. I'm not going to let you know there was a swanton and this and this. That's, that's just not. I'll do that here or there uh, when something really stands out. But that's not really my style of review. You know, I try to get it a little more into what they're building uh, with the stories and the, and the reactions and the crowds and how the show looks and sounds. We're going to talk about how the show looked and sounded. Absolutely. But first, if it's your first time here, hit that subscribe button. This is The Lounge. So um, thank you again for tuning in. Okay, folks, this is the elephant in a room, okay? Impact Wrestling's audio issues. Let me think back to when they first started doing the Twitch shows. I think that was the first kind of like house show style thing they started doing was like, hey, we're broadcasting on twitch i think it was called brace for impact i remember like km was on the show i think it was with his his uh promotion this was back when they were kind of partnering with the indie shows and uh i remember on twitch there was like there i don't remember how many people were watching but it, it was by far the largest audience they had had on on twitch for these shows and i talk about that all the time episode number one of something is always going to be you know People are going to tune in out of curiosity, so that's always going to be the big, um, you know, the big number. Doesn't matter if it's the XFL. Doesn't matter if it's wrestling. Like usually that first episode, the first ever uh, rampage, whatever. Like those are the big numbers that you know you're going to have a hard time getting to again. So um, we tune in for the first time, and the video quality and the issues and the camera work were horrible. I don't remember that audio being an issue because this was a while ago, but the camera work was God awful and it looked like horse shit. And then over time, they would continue to do these shows. And they just continued to either look or sound like shit. I think it was the uh, the, the zero fear one with Pentagon in, in Ohio where the, the lights went out or something. Um, and, and this is con this is consistent, guys. I have had my share of technical difficulties on this channel. But I don't do this for a living. I don't even do this for the profitability anymore because I don't um I don't really upload like I used to to where it was a profitable channel for me. Like now it's we're we're a point where it's like a hobby. So I'm going to have my issues because I have a lot of other shit going on. But when this is what you do and you're trying to build a fan base, grow a fan base, keep your current fan base engaged. You have to put your best foot forward. That's why I have knocked for years and years the marketing, the social media, the uh, the editing of the show, and have expressed my importance in Hiring pro real professionals 
who know what they're doing, not, um, you know, not intern level people. You obviously want to have a degree of those people. Uh, but that's why you bring in the best. And so I'm always bringing up the fact that NXT, um, what else is on TV? Obviously, AEW, WWE, okay? And, and women are wrestling, which also looks way better and sounds better than Impact. These are the TV shows, okay? And I know I repeat myself with this quite a bit, but if I, I understand you're on Access TV. But if you're a television product, you're going to be compared to other television products. That's just how it is. There's no, you know, it, it, it just is. It doesn't matter what the channel is. We know Impact doesn't have the budget of these other companies. But that doesn't mean cut corners. Because this is not, you know, there's going to be the Impact apologists who say, well, you know, th these things happen. It's, li it's like my, my teenage daughter. She is late to school twice a week. Because she sleeps in past her alarm. All right. This is consistent throughout the school year. And she will still tell you, oh, you, you know, it was an accident. You know, no, it, it's a habit at this point. This means you're not taking the necessary actions to fix it. Okay. I was late to work um, a couple months ago. Not even that. Yeah. A couple months ago. I, for whatever reason, shut off my alarm. I don't even recall doing it, but sometimes when you're sleepy, you do it. And I wake up at 3.15, so it happens from time to time. That happened, and it scared the shit out of me. And I was like, this cannot happen again. So now it's, you know, put my phone out of reach, um, backup alarms. I make some kind of effort to, to say, you know what, this cannot happen again. I cannot be late to work again. I can't get written up like this. This can't happen. Okay. That is making a mistake and then fixing it. It's making a mistake doing something about it. But when it is constant, it is every single time one of these things stream on Impact Plus and or YouTube Insider, Ultimate Insider, whatever. It's consistent. And that show I'm talking about, that Brace for Impact show that happened on Twitch, that happened, I think, I want to say 2017. If not 2016. It was one of those two years. Okay. It is 2023 right now. We're talking about five, six years now. Consistent audio, video issues with these shows consistent now there's been some here or there that that are okay all right i'm not saying every single one but it feels like 80 90 percent that's what it feels like at least but it, it is consistent it is a habit at this point this isn't an accident i'm not saying they're doing it on purpose you know someone doesn't sleep in past their alarm on purpose but it but it is a habit at this point that they are not taking the necessary steps to fix. They're not bringing in the necessary professionals in there to fix it. That is what the problem is. This show was almost unwatchable. The pre-show, the first match was fine. To my knowledge, I, I think it was fine unless I didn't catch it. And then the second match. At one point, the commentary team, their PA turned on, and they were calling the action for about 30 seconds over the freaking PA. And there was feedback, and it sounded like garbage. And then they fixed it. All right, awesome. But for some reason, the rest of the show sounds like crap. There was a, and, and there's people, again, the impact apologists, all right? Impact can do no wrong. They were watching a show, like they were sitting there like pigs and shit. Um, this didn't bother them. I watched the first half of the show on my phone. So it was amplified. Uh, I watched the second half this morning on TV. I shut it off. I said on Twitter, there's too much NBA on tonight for me to be watching this horse shit. Um, that, that looks and sounds like this. I just can't. 
Um, so I put on something else. And I finished the show this morning when I woke up. Um, so there's this tink that this uh, s- s- squeaky noise that is happening every few seconds, and it's throughout. I'm gonna pick my nose here. I'm sorry, guys. I'm throughout the entire show. Not one match, not two matches. The entire show. I have no clue what that sound was. I, I, as much as I've dealt with like audio video in my life, I have no effing clue. But this is what, you know, people say, oh, why don't they stream the pay-per-views on, on, you know, YouTube insider and, and this and that, Th- this is why, can you imagine getting people to sign up for bound for glory and streaming it and it doing this? So it's making this sound throughout the entire thing. It sounds like my son, he has a loft bed. Um, you know, a metal loft bed. And when he moves, it squeaks a little. It sounded like he was moving every five seconds. And that was, you know, just this sound is throughout the whole damn show. At one point, we'd lost audio. Um, at one point, I, and maybe it was just me, but during the hex match, my, my phone froze. Like I could hear the match, but it was frozen on the action for, for a while. I even tried re- rewinding and stuff and it wasn't fixing it. So, you know, maybe it was my personal stream on my phone and my Wi-Fi. I, I, I don't know. But at one point, the audio went totally out. And then it was super quiet to where you would have had to have your phone or your TV turned up all the way to even hear anything. And then it just kicked in. So I'm sure those of you who had it all the way up all of a sudden got scared to death because the audio kicked in. They did a, uh, a New Japan, not the New Japan, but the whatever... Uh, multiverse show they're doing with them. They they ran an ad for that. You couldn't even hear the audio of the voice over the music. Uh, if I was not an Impact podcaster, or I should say a podcaster who covers Impact, let me not sound like I'm official, I would not have finished this show. Uh, when I shut it off last night, I was done. I was like, I'm not watching this. But then I was like, I have a duty to watch this. So I, I woke up this morning and I watched it. But this was really, um, really frustrating, really annoying. And I know that I've talked about it here for about 10 minutes. Um, and that's that's a hell of a rant. But uh, when 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 does it stop? When does it stop? Okay, let's get let's get into this freaking um, no surrender again. As I said, it can be a little difficult to to just review matches without any kind of storyline um, storyline stuff happening in between the matches and all that. But you know, you know, I do my best. I've been doing this for a while, so um, let's talk about this. The pre-show started off with Deanna Perazzo versus Giselle Shaw. I love both of them. Um, this is a food fight angle. This is there was um, chili thrown backstage. There was chili thrown in this match. Clearly, the chili is ice cold because no one reacted as if it was hot. I can understand in this, you know, the chili is a little cold for this match. But when they were in the cafeteria or the uh, or catering, whatever you want to call it, and she threw the chili on him, that shit should have been burning. My son had chili last night. He got braces and he has a hard time right now chewing. So he had to have chili. That shit is, you know, even if you just make it in the microwave or whatever, like it's hot. There's you, It's one of those things you can't just make it and it's like the right temperature. It's like burning hot. It takes a while to cool off, too. So when you're eating it, it's, it's going to be pretty warm. Unless it's been sitting out all damn day. So um, maybe they could have done something else. Applesauce. You know what I mean? Regardless, they should have done nothing. Uh, because it's it's very stupid, and the Impact fans don't like it. Deanna Perrazzo, we're, we're to the point now, she seems to be like a full, full-fledged full baby face. I only saw half of the Impact episode. I just haven't gotten around to it. Um, I, I saw half, but, you know, um, I usually watch on Fridays, but No Surrender happened last night, so I only saw about half of it. But we're, we're to the point here, I think Deanna's a, a baby face. Um what I was talking about previously is that I know she, they like rolled her contract over. Um, maybe it was against her will. I don't know. But what she's doing right now to me is like, I'm in the last year of my deal. Don't give a shit. That's what it, that's what it looks like with Deanna. 
um, Giselle and Dion have a pretty pretty decent match. There's a uh, there's chili involved, of course. Uh, you know what? What this wasn't was the chili from this or the episode. Now now I'm running the uh, running the two of them together. I think that the cold, I think the chili uh, in the ring was from um, happened on like BTI or something like that. So I, th- I think I'm wrong. I don't think it was involved here. It's just because I watched these things back to back. Um, but Giselle, but G- Giselle gets the win. Savannah Evans comes down, and then Giselle hits that running knee, which, I mean, Jonathan Gresham uses a similar knee. Eddie Edwards does. Uh, Giselle, who has one of the best finishers I ever seen, just decided I'm going to come to Impact and not do that. Um, I'm going to hit people with a running knee instead. Anyway, this is an impact finisher rant. I've I've done enough of those. Savannah Evans comes down and she um she assists Giselle Shaw. Giselle Shaw just beat Savannah Evans a couple weeks ago. And they're throwing Savannah right back into this bodyguard bullshit. Um I, I guess the story was that Giselle can't find a you know, no one wants to be her partner. So I uh, you know, now she found someone. I don't know. I I, I thought Savannah Evans like kind of teaming up with um, Steph DeLander. Neither of them beat anybody, uh, but they're very similar in stature. I thought they would be a cool team, uh, very different than anything you see in, in wrestling, you know, two women of that uh, of that stature on a team. That's what I um, kind of thought was going to happen. Maybe maybe too much fantasy booking right there, but that's, that's kind of what I thought, and I thought it would have been kind of cool. This seems extremely thrown together. Um, I would have rather they signed someone who fit the gimmick of uh, Giselle and Jay and added them to this. And now Savannah, you know, is she back in this like bodyguard role? I, I don't really know. But I think the finish kind of got over like a fart in church uh, because you're talking about um, a pre-show where you're trying to get people to tune in for the rest of the episode and you kind of give them a TNA finish. Um, you know, maybe it was because they they thought – the Savannah Evans uh, interruption would get some chatter going on social media. I, I don't really think so because she doesn't win enough matches for anyone to like truly care from that standpoint. But it seems like Savannah was starting to come into her own a little bit. And it's like they just I don't know if the, any wrestling company knows how to book wrestlers of this stature properly. It, it's always within this this the same box um, of the bodyguard of the muscle of the heavy um, and I don't see how she fits what Giselle Shaw is doing. So it's it's it feels extremely thrown together. Then after this, we get Jonathan Gresham versus Mike Bailey. Um, two great wrestlers. It was a little hard for me to care because it was just like a good wrestling match. And those, you know, I talk about that all the time. Doesn't that doesn't tickle my fancy? It doesn't tickle my dick. Um, you know, just just let's have an awesome wrestling match. But it was a great match. I think Jonathan Gresham uh, should be more featured on the show on Impact. I think he's really, really good. Um, and he's someone that, um, despite his smaller stature, like he, the way Impact is, like he, he could be a believable champion there, M- much like in Ring of Honor, he was, you know, um, like on AEW or something, WWE, he couldn't get away with it. But uh, in the, this company, he could be, he could be champ. So I would like to see him do a little bit more. And John Gresham ultimately wins with a roll-up. That's the only way they beat Mike Bailey is is via roll-up. That's one of the guys that they, uh, you know, they feel they can hitch their wagon to. So they're not going to beat him with finishers. Um, you know, he'll lose cleanly, but he's not going to uh, lose decisively. So uh, I was I was fairly certain the match was going to end up with some sort of roll-up. And that's what it did. I, I'm glad that Jonathan Gresham won. Uh, they they don't like for Mike Bailey to lose, but I'm glad I'm glad Gresham won because uh, because I like him better than Mike Bailey. But these are both like really really good wrestlers. Um, and, and we're talking about audio and the the visual and all that stuff. And Spooky the cat who never never leaves my side. I can cradle him like a baby, and he's like perfectly good to go. Um, I've told this story before that he was a barn cat that his mama got killed by a coyote. Um, and I inherited him bottle fed him, you know, raise him like my child. Um, so that's why he doesn't leave my side. And, um, you know, I can cradle him like this, like a, 
like a baby and he's, you know, he's a pig and shit. He's very happy. So, um, but we talked about the video. They're back on the entrance ramp. So was the, was the angle of showing us the crowd uh, just for last set of tapings for whatever reason? Are they going to go back uh, to this bullshit? Um, it's the same venue for the tapings. So I feel like they're going to go back to this. This place is clearly sold out. It's clearly packed. And I always talk about, you know, try some new camera angles. To, you know, give us something different. And they, they do some new camera angles that are awful. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, they did one that was like really, really close. And uh, I didn't like it. But what they did a couple times on this show was they wait. And they've done this in the past a little bit. They do it during pay-per-views. Uh, the camera is from, you know, several rows back to where it shows a lot of the audience. But it's showing the action in the ring, too. I think that's a camera angle that would separate impact a little bit um, if they used it a little bit more. I'm not saying it's the dominant camera angle, but I think it's it shows all the people there. And I think it's a completely different uh, way of watching wrestling. And I think if they showed a little bit more of that, it would look uh, it, it would just it would just add a different uh, flair flair to the show. So um I liked it. I liked it very much. But, you know, they clearly had plenty of people here, but they continue to to black them out uh, to make it dark. And I would understand if they sh they shine like a light on the ring, like a really bright one. Uh, I could understand. OK, well, the crowd's dark, but it's all dark, you know. Um, but I know a lot of people are really disappointed uh, with the camera angle. This is pretty consistent amongst the impact fan base that they're they're tired of. Uh, looking at the entrance ramp, it's 13 people. It's it's drenched in red. Um, you know, people people want to see people. You know, people enjoying having fun, engage with the show, and the fans are going to be engaged if they know they are part of the show. They know they might be on TV. You, you know what I mean? Then we got Frankie Kazarian versus Khan. Uh, most people didn't care about this. Uh, just because I kind of do like Khan probably more than the average Impact fan, you know, I was in it. He he was he kind of um, his ring gear was kind of reminiscent of his good uh, um, days with NXT when when he was part of the Ascension. That's kind of what he was, uh, you know, what it looked like. And if you weren't watching NXT back then, the Ascension was one of the best parts of the show. They were heels, but extremely over, extremely dominant. And they really, really pulled it off. That that's a magic that they need to try to find with the design with with Angels and Khan as a team. They got to find that magic somehow, um, because Khan just he does not come off like that. He comes off like just in a, in a way that that wrestling fans he has a gimmick that wrestling fans don't really care for anymore. Uh, so so I, I wish they could you know, find a way to um, tap into that. They got Santino on commentary here for whatever reason. Um, I I stated the last time I did a podcast that the Santino humor in WWE, um, although good, was very quick, very short, lots of one-liners. Uh, there wasn't long dialogue like like he has to do now. Uh, he was not on commentary calling matches. And I think it takes him out of his comfort zone a little bit because that's not what the gimmick has been. So they feel the need, obviously, for whatever they're paying him or whatever they think um, his involvement is going to add to the numbers of the show, whether it's social media or, or the actual episode. Uh, they feel the need to justify he's got to be on TV this this much, you know, clearly. Unfortunately, I'm someone who, who's always liked the Santino character, so it doesn't bother me that much. But I do stand by the fact that I think they're putting him in roles that are outside of his comfort zone a little bit, and and it makes the gimmick not as not as funny. You know what I mean? Um, but Frankie Kazarian and uh, you know Khan had a match. It finished with a cutter. Um, you know how I feel about the cutter. Um, yeah, Sammy Callahan accidentally hit Khan with a chair. Why does he want to be a part of the design? 
you know, if he was like, I want to be part of the design, but he's like one, he's also 100% invested in the design. This would work, but it's like, I want to be part of the design, but I'm going to let you treat me like shit. And I'm going to make you question me. I, I don't understand this. I don't think anyone understands it, but um, we're going to see. Then we get the death dolls versus uh, the hex. I don't know why they're just calling them hex. I mean, it's the hex. I guess that's small potatoes, but it, I, it's just odd to me. Um, I was not happy about the outcome of this match. Obviously, these are my girls. Um, I've been waiting for the hex to come come in. I had said on many podcasts, the only interesting thing you can do with the belts at this point is to bring the hex in. You bring the hex in, giving them an immediate shot at the titles, and they lose. And the thing that I like to say when it comes to these knockouts tag team titles, what I like to point out is that the division is not that big. The list of challengers is not that big. The list of possibilities is not that big. And every time there's a fresh team, they just wrestle for the championship the next week. There's absolutely no build to the Knockouts tag team division. And it's a the division that needs that build because there's not that many options. So you have to drag some shit out a few weeks. But the Death Dolls come in. I mean, excuse me, the Hex comes in. And they lose. For what? Who's waiting for the Death Dolls? That they haven't already wrestled and haven't already beat. Who's waiting for them? Obviously, Impact knows better than me. They know what the they know what they're doing. They, you know, we like to think so at least. They know who the challenges are coming up. They know what they're doing next. And although Impact doesn't do a lot of rematches at pay-per-views, clearly the Hex is not in just for this. Clearly, you you flew them in for Las Vegas. They're not going home the next day. They're probably doing the tapings. Clearly, they're going to get another sh- crack of these belts. Now, Rebellion's coming up. You know how Impact does it. You know Maybe it's going to be four, four teams, and then the Hex wins. Like, why? You know, but, you know, and the flip side of this, I don't want them to just like bring in a tag team and win the titles like they did with the, the, uh, what the hell those girls call the inspiration. So it was out of the, their name. Um, yeah, because there was the iconics and they were, is that right? Is that the inspiration and impact? Um, I just know they had two eyes, but they came in and they won the titles immediately because that's impact does that. Uh, so I, I know that's like really contradictory to me, but these are not the iconics, you know, this is, this isn't a team coming in from WWE and coming in, winning the title on their first night. Um, this is, you know, these are girls who have history with impact, both of them. Uh, Allison K has, you know, I, I believe multiple knockouts titles reigns. I want to say she, she's a two time, she might just be one, but she also had the coveted uh, global force women's championship as well. So uh, these are girls with a history with the company, you know, kind of like when Frankie Kazarian came in and won the X division championship, <laughs> you know, but we're also in a place where the dead dolls probably needed to lose the belts. I, I, you know, I don't know. Um, because at least when, uh, Allison, uh, excuse me, not Allison K, but uh, Billy K and and the other girl, whatever the hell their their names are now, Jessica K, isn't it something like that? Um, when they came in, there was also the influence there, and there was there was there were some teams. We still had some teams to to choose from, but like right now, there's nothing. Is it going to be, you know, Savannah Evans and Giselle Shaw next? That's not really exciting for me. Uh, if, if they're going to win the belts, I, I would just rather you put them on the hex. So the match was okay. Um, of course they, they, with the death dolls entrance, they can only do it correctly. Like once a month where the cameras are in the right place. They do the stomp and the screen, uh, 
moves. You know, they they uh, messed that up on the Impact episode. Uh, it didn't happen here. I don't understand them. But whatever. I know a lot of you don't care about that kind of stuff. But, it, you know, having some cool entrances here and there, that's what breaks up the show to where it doesn't feel like we're watching the same shit every week. So, I don't know. I, I'm pretty... Uh, I'm pretty disappointed um, from a fan standpoint and then just a podcaster standpoint of uh, what this finish here. I, I think if, if the death dolls move on and, and do something like Giselle, Sean, Savannah Evans, I think that's ice cold. I think that's an ice cold feud. I don't think that's something um, people really want to see, you know, like, Hey, let's, let's throw together a tag team um, that doesn't fit, you know, they like when actual tag teams are involved and actual tag teams win the belts and the death dolls are over, you know, don't get me wrong, but it's like, I don't, I don't know. I would have just preferred some kind of build here. And then the, the hex winning the belts and they could have carried them for a very long time. You know, they're former NWA women's tag team champions. Uh, you, you don't just bring a team in like that and just lose. So whatever we'll see. Um, I was pretty, pretty disappointed with it though. Then we get Joe Hendry versus Moose. This is the dot combat match. The last time they did a dot combat match, at first I'm like, what am I watching? What the hell is this? But the match ended up being entertaining. And I thought this one was pretty entertaining too. Uh, Joe Hendry's kind of a comedy wrestler. I think comedy wrestlers work best when they don't, uh, you know, you can do like comedy angles i mean comedy uh spots in the match but they're not comedy matches you know so cole caban is a good example he's a comedy wrestler and he does you know comedic stuff but he doesn't have comedy matches it's just the matches the moves he does his move set the you know um the names of the moves and everything like they're they're funny they're humorous they add something different to the match, but the other, he's not crawling under a wrestler's legs and they're letting him, you know? So I really feel like a guy like Joe Hendry, it works if the other wrestler still, man, it still stays in gimmick. Like you're just both in gimmick. Just one guy's funny. It's, it's, and, you know, another example, Orange Cassidy, he's a comedy wrestler. He does the, the little kicks. And when the other wrestler's standing there like a fucking goof, letting him do it, like, the comedy's dictating the match. Um, you, you know what I mean? So, but I think Moose for the fir- for the most part kind of stayed within gimmick. Uh, he put on the VR and started dancing. That was kind of silly, but it was also funny. Uh, I, I when they when they especially when they put it up on the screen, like it was funny. Even though I would rather Moose not do stuff like that, it was it was pretty funny. This is really um beneath moose though feuding for the digital media championship they've always struggled with i shouldn't say always but for the majority of moose's heel run they kind of they have struggled with what do we do with this guy fortunately for him he makes everything work everything is gold with moose i say that all the time i've said it with years he makes everything work we don't really want him to be the digital media champion because it's it's a joke title it works for Joe Hendry. It worked for Cardona, for, for Myers. It didn't work for Rich Swan. Like, what are we doing? Um, you know, it. I wonder what the hell is next for Moose here. He's not in the world title picture. Um, had they brought the digital media championship on and it was a legitimate mid-card title, it would give more people something to do and something to fight for. But it was, it's never been a serious title. It's never meant anything. It's just a prop Um, and Moose shouldn't be wrestling for props. But speaking of props, they did bring out some funny stuff. The Dreamcast, the the remote control car, like the little one. I don't know if the the uh, the bigger remote control car really didn't work, because if it didn't, again, that's just attention to detail. Like check your shit before the match. Does it have batteries? Is it operational? If you're going to put it on TV. Um, but maybe maybe it wasn't supposed to work. Maybe he was supposed to throw it at Moose. I don't know. So they did some, uh, you know, the, the uh, keyboard uh, little covers for the keypads and everything. They did some stuff that was just very different. This is different than a hardcore match. 
and I'm always going to support them doing something different. Even if I don't like the concept, I do appreciate when they're like, let's try something we haven't done before or that someone else isn't doing. I always, always appreciate that. But uh, Joe Hendry wins this thing. Uh, you know, it was a roll up. I think we had three roll up finishes at this point. Um, handful of tights, which kind of tells us maybe this is going to continue. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what the hell's um, next for either of these guys. Um, what else? Me, uh, Gia Miller interviewed Mickey James backstage. And I, I understand they do this on WWE television to where you conduct an interview and then the person walks away and then the interviewer has to stand there uh, looking goofy or looking shocked for like what feels like 10 seconds. It's awkward. I understand WWE does it. Um, I think AEW, they do a good job of, of, of cutting out. You know that, that bullshit video game sound that they like to use all the time? Like use it there. Just cut out of it. They have impact has so many angles in the ring. When I say angles, I, I just mean uh, like the finish of the match that they don't let breathe. Like something shocking happens or a title ch change happens on the show. And instead of like basking in it, it you just hear the, psh, the, the fucking sound and they just move on to something else. Why not do if you're going to do that, do it after these interviews, like instead of making Gia look like a fucking goof, you know, for, for five seconds, just standing there. Come on. Then was the busted open live Bully Ray and Tommy Dreamer. Um, I saw Bully Ray, excuse me, I saw Tommy Dreamer win his beat the clock match. I didn't get to Bully Ray's yet. They said it was with Bupinder Gujar, and he beat a minute and, and, and a half or whatever it was Tommy Dreamer won his match in. I got to go back and see because this, isn't this one of the guys who are like trying to push and do something with? I got to see how they laid that match out. I'm, I'm very curious. Um, how Bully Ray beat him so quickly. I'm hoping there's a, you know, he attacked them from behind before the match started, bloody hit him, bloodied him up and rolled him in the ring and, and, and pinned him. I hope it was something like that. I hope it was an actual competitive match. Although I had no, and I mean, no zero interest in this. Um, and I've said, I find Dave LeGrick a little annoying. I think, I think you guys saw that when he got on screen, very cringe. Uh, even though I didn't have a lot of interest in this, it was done well uh, because these guys are professionals. Even though I've been saying for years, I don't want to see Tommy Dreamer on my screen. He's old. He's fat. Um, he, he He's past his time. Even though I've said that a million times, it doesn't mean I think he's bad at what he does because he's good at what he does. Bully Ray's good at what he does. Bully, Bully Ray has been good in everything he's done with Impact so far. So this was done well. Did I want to see it? Was I excited? Did I think the beat the clock challenge for who's going to speak first was very silly? Absolutely. But then it happens and he gets bully gets to speak first and says nothing but sorry. I mean, yo, they laid this out well. He he was crying at one point, like Tommy Dreamer does. You know, these guys are professionals. They made it work. And then at the end. When it seems like there's some making peace, Bully Ray throws coffee in his eyes. Uh, Dave LaGreca selling the the uh, residual coffee drops that got in his his eyes, even though he has glasses on, was was really cringe. Um, the co the coffee was either clearly hot because this is Tommy Dreamer we're talking about; he's crazy, or it was warm enough, uh, you know, to make his face red for him to sell it. It wasn't like when. Giselle Shaw got the chili and it was just like she was inconvenienced rather than, you know, screaming because it was burning hot on her. Um, this is how you sell something like that. So, you know, it was, it was all well done. And he, you know, he hit, he hits him with the, the thermos. But if I know these guys, I don't know these guys personally, but I, if I know the kind of stuff they've done over their careers, I wouldn't be shocked if this actually wasn't a uh, fairly hot coffee. Not to the point he's going to, um, you know, get a third degree burn. Is that a third degree burn when it's, that's worse than first, right? Uh, I mean, uh, less than a first degree, right? I think that's just when it's like a sun, like a sunburn's third degree, right? I don't know. I got to look that up. 
Um, you know, it was probably at least warm, but but there's no way he threw cold cold coffee on this guy. Uh, and I just thought it was all done well. Here, here's my issue with these old guys. Um, okay, so you're gonna say, and and I see people on Twitter do it. Well, AW has Jeff Jarrett, and they have Billy Gunn, and they have Sting. You know, they they do bring in a lot of old people. Uh, but here's the difference: they're not wrestling each other. Jeff Jarrett is not wrestling Sting on their card. Jeff Jarrett is not wrestling Billy Gunn, and their teams are feuding. Their two respective teams, their respective stables, are feuding, and they're not—they're not wrestling each other in one-on-one action. That is—that is the difference here. You can bring in some of these older dudes, but if you like, like Bully Ray works with the good hands because they're—they're they're younger and they've created a little team, a little stable. Like it works. Tommy Dreamer is more likely to team up with fucking Rhino and Raven, you know, and the Sandman. Even though they're all, you know, two of them can't even wrestle anymore. Like, that's more likely. And that's tapping into the glory days of ECW that people are too old to really care about. That's that's kind of like the point I'm getting at when you're bringing in, um, and I'm talking about the tar- target demographic, the key demo, and, and creating stuff for new wrestlers. Like, Billy Gunn, what he does, um, you know, he, he's involved with a young tag team, and the young fans like them. They're not trying to appeal to the DX fans. You you understand the difference? Um, so that is that is my issue. These guys, I've, I've said all along, are clearly going to have an old school rules match. Uh, that's where it's going. They're probably going to call it a busted open match. I don't know. But it's clearly going like that direction. Um, and I think these guys get YouTube hits. And in fact, thinks, okay, well, people want to see this. Goofy shit. Uh, Santino, look at Santino's YouTube hits. That's probably why he's always on the show. Like they're 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 correlating uh, the two. But when you're correlating things, what the fans actually want to see is what's in the middle. Okay, uh, this is something I've learned recently. Was something else I I do um, on the side. The um, Take this, you know, the average video view, say it's 20,000 views on the Impact YouTube channel. And you take the standard deviation and one of them's, they're putting on something that gets 5,000 views. And then they got something that's getting 70,000 views. I know Impact looks at it and says, well, that what's getting 70,000 views is what we need to put on TV. And that's not necessarily true. What's in the middle, that 20,000 or, or whatever it is, that that average number, that's what needs to be on the television. Because that is a combination of people who care about impact and people who are curious what impact is doing. That's the content that is getting those numbers. That content is represent, representative of the current fan base and people who are coming in and seeing what they're doing. If you see the outside the ropes, they're all 5,000 views. Um, the impact subscribers don't care about it. Uh, I care because it's I've wanted them to do something like that. The problem is they're interviews with music in the background, and they're not you know, getting into the real weeds of the wrestlers and, and getting to really know them. It's, it's uh, The first one with Trey Miguel I thought was good, and they started getting a little kayfabe with it. And the Joe Hendry one, to me, was unwatchable. Uh, playing loud music the whole time you use music in interviews when you're posting clips and you're trying to put and and there's okay he's saying something emotional or saying something that's that's when you bring in music you don't play it for the whole freaking interview you know i I mean i know this is like dating me but you know when when, uh paris hilton was on larry king live in 2010 you know like you didn't have music you know they promoted it with 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 some music clips but they didn't have music in the fucking background of the interview so people don't enjoy that content on the channel. I think they need to continue to do that. Don't get me wrong. I think they have to be better. That 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 um number though, those five five thousand views, is representative of uh, we've created a YouTube channel that is so built on the history of TNA that that's what 
you know, a lot of people are coming for. Uh, they've conditioned us to not care about that kind of content. So uh, that stuff at the bottom, they have to improve and get those numbers up. But that stuff in the middle, I know I'm talking about this a, ro- a lot. I'm trying to get you guys to understand. The stuff in the middle is what people care about. The stuff with the numbers and, I mean, people who don't give a shit, they're, oh my God, what's Bully Ray doing? I used to watch him when I was a kid. Uh, oh, there's some goofy Santino shit. Let me, let me see what's going on with Impact, you know? Yeah, it gets the hits out of curiosity, but it's not a representation of what the content you actually have to be making and creating. So um, that's my rant on that. Uh, and it's something I fully, fully believe in. All right. So we'll see where this is going. I think we have a good idea of where it's going, though. Then Steve Macklin versus Brian Myers versus Heath versus PCO. It's this four-way number one contenders match. We knew that Steve Macklin was winning this when they first did the matches. Just like we knew Rich Swan was going to win this, the six-shooter match. And there's storytelling here. There's some good storytelling in this, in the you know, that got us from Rich Swan losing the title to this. It was over two years, but there was good storytelling. There's been story good storytelling with Steve Macklin wanting a title shot, having to jump through hoops uh, while everyone else would just come in and get a title shot. Okay. That's all good. But when it's to the point that we know what the re- results of everything are going to be, that's where I think it doesn't work. I think that if, uh, you know, you did this four-way match and Steve Macklin hadn't been bitching for months and then he wins and there's a real build here, you know, there's going to be a build because it's the pay-per-view. There's months in between this and Rebellion. But if you do a number one contenders match and it seems like everyone in the match is just random, not random, but there's not like a story live involved where they need to, where they're going to wrestle the champion. It's it's kind of like we as fans really don't know who's going to win. Stay Steve Macklin wins at that point. Now you can cut these video. No, I shouldn't even say now. I could say leading up to this match. If you're doing video content from each of these wrestlers, which I've been asking for this you know, we should get a video package, Brian Myers. This is why I need to win this match. This is why I should be champion. Same with Heath. PCO maybe isn't going to talk. But if you're building up to this four-way, and Steve Macklin says at this point, you know, I've watched all these people come in and they just get title matches. And I've beat, you know, and then they start doing a video package showing I beat Rich Swan. I beat this guy, this guy, this. It shows them beating everybody, Kazarian, all the guys that he beat. Now that's a story like, whoa, this motherfucker's right. And 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 then we're like anticipating, I think he's going to win. At, at this point, you know, they're still kind of giving away the finish because his video package tells a different story than everyone else's. And, and a story, you know, really shows why he should win and why he probably will. So I appreciate the long-term story, but not to the point like we've known for months Swan was going to get a title match at some point. So all these other title matches Josh is doing, we know he's not going to lose. You know, like like you should somewhat go into these title matches wondering if it's possible that there's going to be a title change. And that's why I, I, th- I think I said this back in like around Bound for Glory. It's like they're doing too much with Josh. Like there's too many title matches at once, too many people saying they want. It just tells us that all these matches as, as they go on, he's not going to lose. Because he's going to wrestle all these dudes. We just know, you know? So I, I just think if you focus on that one feud, um, and you, you can still tell that story, but without telling us you're telling it. You know? That's just like the best example I can say with Steve Macklin. He doesn't say shit all this time until this opportunity comes up, and he's like, yo, this, this, and this. And then we would really appreciate the storytelling even more at that point. You know, very similar with Rich Swan. Like, you know, if we didn't, if he wasn't on Impact Television five months ago, oh, I want a title shot one day. If they just let him organically win this fucking match, the six shooter, and then starts getting into these video packages that they've been doing the last couple of weeks, it'd be a lot more effective. That being said, this match was actually not bad. Uh, we know that Brian Myers or Heath is not going to win this thing. Like, we just know. And I think it was pretty clear that PCO was going to come and cost Eddie the match because PCO cost Eddie the match the opportunity to get into this thing. And we know that they're feuding. So we know Steve Macklin is winning this thing. 
Uh, there's not much I'm going to say about it other than I'm excited for it. I think he needs to beat Josh Alexander. Uh, they have an opportunity here, though, to to uh, to have their generational feud. Steve Macklin, Josh Alexander, something that they can revisit many times. Uh, something that might be able to go down and impact in TNA history books um, as one of the classic feuds. They have a real opportunity here uh, to do something special with a couple homegrown guys. So I'm excited for it. I am. Um, but I think Steve Macklin needs to win. And he won this match, and he really has no busy business losing. At that point, who's Josh going to fight? You know, he's, he's already wrestled everybody. He's wrestling Kenta, defending the title, like the next, uh, uh, you know, like not this episode of Impact, but the next one, I think. Like, why? Why is he defending the championship when you have announced that at Rebellion, it's Josh versus uh, Steve Macklin? Now it, maybe this is a non-title match, and I and I missed the fine print. That's very possible, but I feel like it's not. Why? Okay. Why is he even wrestling singles matches against against God like that right now? You know, I think Impact does best when their world champion is is uh, approaching a pay per view and doesn't really like they did this with Moose. You know, d- doesn't like wrestle every single week. In a way, it makes it a little more special next time he gets in a ring. Then we get uh, the Bullet Club versus Time Machine. I think everyone really enjoyed this. Uh, it's a it's a little out of the realm of what I like from wrestling. Um, I've never been a big like six man, eight man tag fan because uh, this you know this comes off more as a an exhibition of moves rather than you know telling any kind of believable story in the ring. But there was a place for it on the card because th- there was nothing else like this on the card. So there's a place for it. So it works. And uh, I-, I would imagine everyone really, really enjoyed this. Uh, it was good to see Kenta in the ring. Uh, and as much as I'm not like a Bullet Club guy, I've always liked Kenta. Uh, you know, that just dates back to my, uh, you know, enjoying him as Hideo Itami in NXT. Uh, and I've-, I've seen a little bit of him since, but. You know, it basically it's basically built off those days. I'm not going to say I've been following him uh, on a regular basis since, but it was good to see him in an Impact Ring. I've always kind of wanted to see him show up, and uh, you know, the uh, the Bullet Club wins this thing. The Bullet Club is eventually going to beat the Machine Guns for the the titles. We know this, um, but they're doing a nice little tag team feud, having really good matches. You know, for those who like that kind of wrestling, I. I just would imagine they were very, very entertained. Mickey James, knockout champion versus Masha Slamovich. This was pretty good. I don't think Mickey James can carry a match anymore. I think she has to have opponents like this to have good matches. Uh, you know, she's not one. It she's not like Diana, whoever she wrestles, it's going to be pretty good. Uh, you know, Mickey's, I, I think, kind of past that point in her career, but this was uh, a great match. I, 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 you know. Th- I kept saying I was really interested to see how Masha was ultimately going to lose this this uh, this match because we you know they were telling uh, a story where she was involved with Bubba and and all this shit up to this point or Bully Ray I'm sorry he's not Bubba Ray so I was kind of like you know what where is this going um, Masha was undefeated for like nine months or whatever and then she's lost uh, three of her. No, four of her last five matches, I think, or four of her last six, something like that. I feel like she might have beat a jobber or something recently, uh, but I think she lost four of six. Uh, so the the bloom is off the rose at this point. Um, you can't just keep having. I mean, you can't just keep having her wrestle for the fucking title at, at this point. Once she ultimately wins, like it's a, it's a fart in church, you know. Uh, there's there's a story that can be told where someone can't quite get over the hump and then they finally do and it's organic you know but but with this it's kind of like you've had her lose so much so quickly after trying to build her as this unstoppable monster like what was the, why did you ha- why did they have this match I don't understand because I know why because they need to defend every title on every show. Uh, I think, uh, this is ultimately leading to, and I think mo- majority of the fans feel like this, um, Nick Aldis coming in, uh, tagging with Mickey James 
and probably Bully's going to team up with Masha. I, I feel like that's where they're going with it. They've, you know, they want to take us off the scent. So even though there's kind of a story with Bully and Mickey James going, uh, that's not really a thing right now because Bully's doing the Tommy Dreamer thing. But I feel like that's where um, they're going with it. And, uh, you know, Bully obviously needs a female on his side. And I think it'd be most beneficial if it's a, if it's a young up and comer from the roster, not bringing in um, an old talent to, to tag with them, you know, like Tara or something like that. You know, I, I think um, you have Masha on the team. I think that's what works. So we'll see. I'm pretty sure that's where it's going, but this was, this was a, a pretty enjoyable match. And I thought the finish of it was really good. You know, it's, it's roll up number four on the show, but I could, but a roll up like this, uh, the way that it was done, we haven't seen a finish like this. Uh, the way that that she, you know, escaped the move and 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 pinned her in the corner, and it was very out of nowhere and unexpected. And and you know, that's a roll up where you roll someone up, and then they should be shocked after. Like if it's a small package, that's stupid. When they're like have that dumb dumbfounded look on their face, like I can't believe they beat me with that. Like this, this is where Masha should be. Like, what the effing fuck, you know? So I so I kind of like the finish of it, and you know it was overall a, a pretty good match. And let's get into Josh Alexander versus Rich Swan Impact World Championship. Jot this shit down, monkeys. Uh, there's not going to be a better Impact Wrestling match in 2023 than this. When they have their little cards at the end of the year, where they're like, uh, you know, what, what's the what's the match of the year? And they're going to have some bullshit on there, like um, Brian Myers versus somebody, like because they always have, you know, they put way too many matches on there. Uh, they're going to have matches you don't even remember happened. There's nothing. There's nothing that they can do that's going to be better than this. The story told in this match, during the match, before the match, after the match, masterful. Rich Swan is getting that organic reaction again that he was getting before he got hurt before they forced the title on him and i guess i, I granted there was no fans back then so you know uh you that's up for debate but um he's getting that organic build again the fans wanted to see him win and you know the fact that he didn't want to shake his hand before the match he said i'll, I'll shake it after let's you know i've been waiting two years for this like that's a fucking story that's how you do it and even on commentary, like, well, Josh just wanted to have a good match with his friend. And that's that's what a lot of this is. And it was a long match, but it, it it just made sense. It wasn't like versus Mike Bailey having a long match just for the sake of a long match. Or him versus TJP, let's have a long match just for the sake of it. Versus Kazarian, let's have a fucking long match. Just to do it. You know, the story that was told here was so different than anything. And granted, you know, Frankie cause cashed in all, you know, uh, option C so that maybe that match doesn't fall into this category, but I mean, yo, they, they just, you, you can't put on a better match than this. I don't care. I can't think of anyone on the roster that could possibly wrestle Josh. Cause Josh is going to be in the match of the year. You know, you know, it's going to be him or Mike Bailey, uh, you know, there's only a handful of guys, Frankie Kazarian, that could be involved in like a match of the year with impact, but you know, Josh is going to be involved in it. And Rich is another one who could be involved in with a number of guys. But just everything they did, the, the move set, um, that the reversals, the, uh, the near falls, everything. Rich Swan as a sympathetic figure and getting the crowd fired up, and they play his music, and he's not coming down dancing and all this shit. Like, he's serious. I mean, this is a fucking wrestling match, folks. This was uh, five-star. This was Slammiversary, Bound for Glory level. This was incredible. Neither of these guys can have a bad match. You know, Rich Swan cannot have a bad match. It is, it is impossible. There was there was a story here that was lacking when Rich Swan wrestled Kenny Omega because when he wrestled Kenny Omega, he looked like a fool up to the match, during the match, and after the match. Is that what they were going for? I don't know. But and and when we were watching that match versus Omega, Kenny Omega, at no point 
during the match did it feel like Rich Swan was going to win. There was no near fall or or he didn't have a series series of offense, a flurry of moves. There was nothing that happened in that match where like Rich might pull this thing out. Kenny Omega pretty much dominated him in the match. And it really, I didn't think was that good of a match. I know I say uh, Swan can't have a good match, but I mean a bad match. But we also know we think he got hurt during this match and uh, Impact was uh, slobbing the knob of AEW at the time. And that was the, I think that was the story they were going for, that our world champion's going to get his ass kicked. Uh, he, Rich Swan even said he got his ass kicked. But at no point did, he, did it feel like he was going to win. This one felt like he could, there was points where you thought he was going to win. Now, Impact released a graphic for the tapings where Josh Alexander is clearly the champion still. And then they try to fix it by like, whoa, should he retain? Like, nice try. Just because you're trying to sell a couple tickets, you don't have to tell us the story ahead of time. But whatever. Have a backup graphic where no one has belts. And then release as I say, should he retain? That makes sense. That makes more sense. But um, they killed it. They killed it. I, it was long and I didn't even care. This match was incredible. They did a good uh, angle after the match, and I think they just aired on Twitter. But um, Impact is doing good stuff right now. There's episodes where they they do some of the stupidest shit I've ever seen in my life. And I said on my last review, not the last review, but the, two weeks ago when they put, on the, put out that horrible episode, horrible, I said this isn't a representation of the Impact Plus shows. I don't even know what the hell they call them. Impact Plus shows, monthly specials. There's no branding to this whatsoever. Uh, but it's not a representation of what we see on these shows. Now, granted, the first half of this show was not. I did not think was good. I really think up until um, up through the Hex and, and Death Dolls match, I was not enjoying this show. There were some good matches here and there. Whatever. I don't even know if I was fully enjoying this show until the knockouts championship match, to be totally honest with you. I think that, um, you know, time machine and bullet club was cool because it, it was fun. Uh, it's just not necessarily my style of match. I thought the, the fatal four way or the that's WWE's name, the four way match, the number one contender. I thought they over delivered in there. I thought the, the busted open stuff was actually pretty good, but I, I you know, I, the dog combat match was, was, good for what it was but the knockouts tag team title match and and con versus kazarian and uh you know mike bailey and gresham even though it was a good match it was just just a match uh you know and the, and the pre-show stuff which that was a pre-show match but i mean deanna and Giselle, i was kind of like this i'm just I, I, don't, I don't really know what i think of this show so far and maybe it was just the audio issues that's might might have been really what it was um, the second half I watched on my TV, I was able to, you know, turn the volume down a little bit. Um, and it, you know, it didn't bother me as much. Did the show sound like shit? Absolutely. You cannot stream Bound for Glory, anything like this on this platform until you fix it and bring in like real professionals that aren't going to, aren't going to mess up because again, it just, it's just a habit at this point. So as a, to, as a whole, I don't think no surrender was one of their better shows. I think it was one, you know, it definitely was towards the bottom. I won't say it was towards the middle. It was towards the bottom, in my opinion. But that main event, classic, absolute classic that they should be playing 10 years from now. I loved it. Um, and we'll see. We'll see what they do with Rich Swan from here. There's a little bit more of that organic, like, excitement to him again. So we're going to see what, the, what the, you know what they do with him. Uh, but that's going to do it for me and Spooky the Cat. Um, I'm not going to review the episode of Impact. Number one, I didn't watch it all the way, but it's it's kind of pointless at this point because, uh, you know, some, <laughs> some of the build, laughing at Spooky here, some of the build had to do with No Surrender. And, you know, we're, we're, we're going to start a new era here. Not a new era, but we're building up to a new show uh, with these new tapings. And uh, we'll get into to, to some impact. So thanks for checking me out, folks. I'm your boy, BQ. I'm out. Peace.